Good day and welcome to another episode of From the Ivory Tower. My name is Omotayo Alo and today, um, as usual, we like to bring you something educative, informative and something that actually spurs you to make informed choices and of course give you the intellectual argument to issues happening around you. And today I'm speaking with an academic who is not just an academic, is a social entrepreneur, is a writer, is a teacher in all respects. His name is Abayomi Fawayomi. But before we go to the discussion segment, let's just go on this quick short break and I'll be right back. Welcome to you to From the Ivory Tower and happenings around the country. Varsity teachers get to air their views. Students are actually not left out. We bring you intellectual ends from the events happening around you. It is dedicated to educating the populace with a spice of entertainment. From the Ivory Tower, Tuesdays, only on Core TV News. Nice to have you on the program today. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, um, straight to the business of the day. Um, of course, um, we'll start with... Um, with the recent thing that just happened that involved the whole of um, Nigerian citizens, which is the general elections that just passed. But of course, the elections have come and gone, but people have not stopped talking about it. There's been a lot of activities that have been trailing the elections and, and all of this. So, for, for you, I would like you to, what's your assessment of the last election that um, we experienced in Nigeria? Okay, um, Preston, thanks for the question. Now, uh, this last election was a significant one, was a watershed. Uh, I would say perhaps one of the freest elections we have had uh, from the point of view of uh, the use of technology. I mean, t for me, the PVC was a game changer. I mean, so you had uh, a sense in which the PVC enabled us to have people believing that their votes counted. And that was one of the things that made it possible for there to be a change. Uh, it was just because people believed that their votes counted. So it's something very different. What was also very important that was very different about this election for me, and which is something that is notable, is the fact that the regulator of the uh, space, that's INEC, seems to have a better understanding of their role. Uh, which is which is much uh, which is a great improvement over most of the times when we have had either from Medpedeco or NEC. Uh, we have this current crop seems to have a better interpretation of their role uh, as it is. Of course, I would say that the political actors, as in politicians, have not changed. They still remain a little bit backward uh, in terms of their interpretation of issues and their response. Uh, the last thing I also want to say was the significant in, in, in involvement of Nigerians in the process. So Nigerians were involved as politicians, as voters, as communicators, as social media activists, which all defined it um, and perhaps gave us the result that we wanted. Um, interesting, you talked about the card readers and of course what the independent electoral body expected is that with the use of the card readers and the issue of questioning the result of the election should be minimal, but of course the card readers failed at some point and we have um, a lot of candidates going to the tribunal to seek redress and, and all of this. So for you, how could we make it better as we look forward to 2019? I don't know what's going to be better. Technology will always have, I mean, you rarely get any technology that's going to have a 100% um, um, success rate. You rarely, I'm not saying it's not possible. And I remember the statistics from Professor Jaga was something less than 1%. I mean, so in Nigeria now, virtually all of us withdraw money from ATMs. But would you say every time you went to the ATM, you got money? That would, that's not the case, right? But we have accepted it. So the question is, technology will always have opportunities for failure. And that's where there's always a backup. So maybe what we could do going forward was to ensure that the backup were effective backup. So where the candidate didn't work, uh, then you have a second machine that you could use. But the PVC was excellent, something that we should sustain. And for me, part of my own next level ad advocacy is for the PVCs to be used for the local government elections. Because what has happened in Nigeria is that because it's the state uh, electoral commission, the CX, that organizes the local government elections, they have their own ways of ensuring results go the way they want, usually uh, to follow the expectation of the government in power in the state. One of the things I think Nigerians should demand for is that they, PBCs must be used in every local government election. I dare say in every election into the public space in Nigeria. And you'll be shocked at the results of those elections. As you know, I've heard about it, the number of people that voted, the number of results we got in this election, were you not surprised? So we had places that naturally you, you have 5 million voters or 
four million voters turning out to have a million plus voters. It was because of the PVCs. Uh, so you realize that if there was no PVC, if we had five million vo registered voters and actually one million came to vote, then you give an opportunity for a politician to do something about the four million difference, which could be rugging, rigging, or thumb printing, or whatever they choose to do. But you know what? Once it's one million PVCs that went out, the total number of votes cannot be more than one million. And that made it very simple. What are your expectations from this very new government? I mean, I, I think one of the things that we need to also bring into the democratic space and leadership praise space is uh, we need to have an effective uh, onboarding and handover process. I mean, so we had a situation where the Minister of Information came out some time ago and said the President was going to hand over on the 28th at a dinner. And some people said they didn't like it and all of that. And then there is a question of we're going to have inauguration on the 29th. Okay, so we need to have technocrats and civil servants and bureaucrats to come up with a process in Nigeria to say handover is different from inauguration because actually there are two separate events. Um, so we have had cases in the U.S., for example, and I'm using the ex U.S. as an example because most of our democratic practices are copied from there, where the, um, where the president was not present at the inauguration. We actually had a case in the U.S. where the president that was leaving office left the, the states that day when this, the successor was going to be inaugurated because it doesn't have to be present at the inauguration. And that's their system. So what we don't have in Nigeria is our own system. So if we have a center that says there is handover, and there is an inauguration ceremony. In the handover, the following people must be present. At the inauguration, the following people must be present. So for example, in Nigerian constitution, at handover, the chief justice must not be present. At inauguration, he has to be present because he has to swear in the new president. So we need to complete that circle and do that. So the new government comes in. I think for me, one thing we, the new government should try to do is to remember everything about the past government was not bad. There's some things that should just continue from where they stop. Some things they need to stop doing and start a new thing. Uh, but some things we need to just build on what has been done. Um, they should also seek out for quick wins. What will get people's confidence? There's a lot of expectation. They also need to do a lot of work managing information to ensure that they don't dampen their enthusiasm. And they also need to take tough decisions. There are two tough decisions that have to be taken in this country in the next three months. And if the government does, if the, the tone of this government will be determined by those three decisions. If they, if they do it well, they cruise. If they do it wrongly, it's going to be bad. Okay. Uh, well, from experience, one would actually judge a good um, democratic setting where there is strong opposition, where we have people questioning the power that be, that is the government in power. But what we are seeing now is as soon as um, the, the power um, swung over to the All Progressives um, Congress Party. We have a lot of PDP members defecting to their party. And one is wondering if everybody moves to the All Progressive Congress, what becomes of an opposition party? And eventually, if they keep accepting, what, what fate do you think this would have on the Nigerian democratic system? Oh, we're going to be the worst for it. It's everybody in this competition. I always tell people that uh, this the, usually, um, I mean, and let me borrow from football because maybe we can relate with that. So there are two great players in the world today. Uh, there is Ronaldo, Ronaldo and there is Lionel Messi. And, and those guys are breaking their records on an annual basis. Why? Every time Messi wants to relax, he remembers Ronaldo. Every time Ronaldo wants to relax, he remembers Messi. When we had the Maradona, there was nobody close to him. When we had the Pele, there was nobody close to him. But the reason why these two guys will break all records is because the two of them are great guys and they're existing at the same time. That's the same thing with democracy and opposition. There's no great leader who doesn't have, if you don't have somebody that keeps you on your toes, you're likely going to um, go into many assumptions or do wrong things or exaggerate your achievement. So we need a credible opposition. Uh, it's unfortunate that our politicians are moving en masse uh, to the APC, and interestingly, the new the president elect has clearly told them it does nothing for them if they come. So perhaps that will reduce that. But I think also one of my own challenges is how I saw a number of people who are activists in the social space becoming partisan. I mean, if a, if a politician leaves PDP to APC, for me it doesn't make a difference because he's a politician. They go where to where the, their bread will be buttered. 
But I'm shocked at the number of activists in the social space who are apolitical, who were are, who are supposed to be guardians of this process, suddenly going on the bandwagon of one of the political parties. And it was massive and significant, and across all ages. So we had people that were like consciences of the nations, independent people you could ask for counsel, suddenly showing up at, at some of those political parties, doing stuff for them. And then you also had younger people, very young elements that you felt would be like the conscious of the nations in the future, also going to get contracts from political parties. Now, so the challenge you have then is that the quality of people that can speak uh, and, and keep this government in check, the quality and the quantity seems to be resilient. Now, quantity from the point of view of the politicians moving, quality from the point of people in the civil society that are also moving. But Nigerians have a role. It's our role to ensure we make this government work and to keep them on their toes. Uh, so if the politicians will not be credible opposition, we should be ourselves. Well, speaking of the PDP, some have actually predicted that as the rate at which they are going, PDP is actually tilting towards crumbling. So do you share in such opinion? I, I don't think so. I, I think I think OPDP has um, a, a great opportunity to get better um, because what happens is that um, we all have failures in life, right? So PDP failed. Um, one of my favorite books is a book written by a man called John Maxwell. They call Failure Forward. Uh, and what the man said is that there's no problem failing. It's what you do after you fail. So PDP has a great opportunity to turn this failure around for good. And ask yourself, there was a time when, uh, was he uh, AD or uh, Alliance for Democrats or whatever party that party was, I can't remember the name, had five governors in the Southwest. Next election, the lost four, they only had one in Lagos State. But what did they do? They didn't cry over that. They built up from Lagos, went into Alliance, uh, and then uh, at last election, they went alone, but went to an Alliance and got an alliance with AP, CPC and AMPP, and, the, and the, that party that had perhaps one state suddenly is controlling the center. So the question is, what do they want to do with what I have? But for me, this is the time for them to know who is actually their party members. There are too many people that were crowding around PDP that were not PDP members. They were just numbers on PDP. This is the time for them to actually know who, was in, who is in PDP. And again, for APC that won, now you have many people crowding in. When the robot hits the road, they need to know who is the real member. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, right now we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be discussing other issues of the national interest. Of course, issues that you're interested in knowing more about. And my guest is still a bio me following me. Stay tuned, please. You can now watch Call TV News Live from anywhere in the world on our website, www.calltvnews.com. Click on live TV on our website and watch us live. And welcome to Cool TV Primetime News. To follow us on Twitter, click on Twitter icon on our website. And Facebook, click on the Facebook and YouTube to see all our previous news production. You can also watch us live on YouTube. Click Cool TV, leave a space, then news. Cool TV News, a 24-hour news station. Looking at the problem of power in the country, um, some would say that the problem of power just got worse at this period of time. And this is something that government after government, there's been a lot of funds being put in the sector that with these, it would get better, it was privatized, the problem got worse. So for you, how can the country uh, overcome this challenge of power? Because it's a very important sector that affects virtually everything. So how can we overcome the problem of power? I, I think for me, um, the question is um, like they ask, how do you eat an elephant? Uh, it says a bit at a time. I think one of the challenges we have had with power reform is that we're trying to eat the elephant at once. I, I do not think that's the best way. I think it's for us to take it a bit at a time. One of which is for us to change the uh, legal system around power. Uh, that can uh, increase the capacity of individuals and states to generate more power without passing through the grid. So we have a current legal system that says when you generate a particular uh, amount of kilowatt, it must go through the grid. Uh, and then you, you practically give it to PACN that distributes. I mean, that doesn't work. So what's my motivation for generating for you to share? So we need to change that policy uh, to increase the threshold. Um, and what that will lead to is immediately you start to have more independent power stations. So for example, in an estate, I can generate all power and my old interest is I look for technology to generate the power and I distribute people in this estate and I'm cool. 
a business that X, Y people can come together. In fact, what you can have is a situation where a residential estate, a resident association can come together and say, you know what, we want to generate our own power ourselves. And they form a company and they look for technology because ask yourself, electricity or power generation is essentially about doing one thing. You are converting energy from one source to another. So you have a choice of converting from solar, you have a choice from converting from turbines driven uh, water projects as the case we have in the dams, you have the wind, you have many options. Of course, not all of them have the same amount of um, um, viability and all of that. But the question is, if we make it what happens in small, small locations, then we can say, oh, the best conversion source in this location should be solar. Then we can say the best conversion source there should be here. Then we can say the best conversion here, and then we can have those small, small solutions. The other thing again is that if we say we are privatizing, we should not just privatize the discos, we should also privatize transmission. So today our transmission capacity is very small. So even if we generate it, the, the transmission cannot take it. And it's something we need to do. The last point is that we need to ask ourselves, those things we say we are privatized, did we really privatize them? Or we gave it to some people? I'll tell you an experience I had. Uh, I went to, so I used a prepaid meter in my house. Um, and um, my card ran out on, fri on Friday or so, uh, no, on Saturday, and then on Sunday I went to where I should recharge because my, my disc or whatever it's called, uh, you still need to go to the office to recharge. I got there on Sunday that I wanted to recharge, they said they don't open on Sundays. That's not a privatization. I mean, I can buy recharge cards <laughs> anywhere, anytime, anyhow. Now, I, somebody says, we don't open on Sundays. Are you, are you, are you a private organization selling power? That's, that's not privatization. Today, if you go to that place, they close at 2 p.m., even on a working day to buy. If you go there at 6 a.m., that's all. Oh, I don't have light in my house. I want to recharge my car. They tell you, wait till 8 o'clock. They have not come. So it's, privatization is not just transferring things into the private hands. It's also about ensuring the environment is what makes the private sector thrive efficiency, competition, reward, and people having incentives to work effectively. That has not happened in spite of the transfer to private sector, and that's why you're not seeing any improvement. Ask yourself, those companies that bought that, since you, didn't, you said their light has been poor, did you get any message for them apologizing? Okay, so would um, the telecoms company have done that? They would do that. If the telecoms company server goes down now, Everybody is on their toes to ensure it comes back in the next two minutes. So why is it not happening here? It's not just about just transferring to the private sector. It must also be about we having effectiveness in that private sector. And if it's not there, it's, it's just as good as government. So uh, I guess this is what the new government should be looking into now to overcome yeah. the problem. And, and, they, and they have every reason to succeed because Lagos State is a state that has done a good job. Lagos State has one of the best quality of data with respect to energy consumption in Nigeria. They've done a lot of surveys around that. Also, Lagos State has also implemented several independent power projects. So you have a project that generates power for the whole of the street lights and some offices in Alausa. You have one that I think generates for um, street lights and some of the court buildings and hospitals around off marina and all of that. So they already know what we're talking about. They already know how to have modular, uh, small uh, systems uh, that makes it work. And that's why when you go around Lagos, if you check the street lights that you always find on in Lagos, are the Lagos power street lights. Don't forget, Todd Milan Bridge also has street lights. But where does that power come from? But the one that comes from those independent power stations are always on. And that's why we should have more of them. Then we'll do that on a small level to when we can now integrate and have something bigger. Well, moving on to uh, the academic sector now, um, it's interesting that in uh, most tertiary institutions, you see students come up with novel projects, no in innovative innovative things, just like you talked about power generation and so on. In fact, that students that generate these things through practical stuff and it's, it's, it's actually a good thing. Well, the problem is those things, you just see them happen just in the classroom and you don't have a replay in the larger society. So I want you to talk about the relationship between the girl and the town. Uh, what do you think is responsible for we just having research that just sleep in the libraries or stay in the lecturer's office and 
these things don't have a play on what the society turn out to be or how we grow eventually. So for you, what, what do you make of this relationship? Okay, um, first thing, I mean, town and down is supposed to be a symbolic relationship. Both of them meet one another. But I think what has happened in Nigeria is that uh, town seems not to have kept up with town. Uh, so you had a situation where you said to have researchers uh, who are not keeping at the, at, at the top of their game. And as a result, uh, town and business never saw anything. So, um, but that's not what happened in other places. Um, Harvard, MIT, are places where companies go to invest money so that they can get them to do research for them. That would not happen in Nigeria because those universities are perhaps at another level where they can even do those kind of research you want for them. So the first thing is that the universities must come up, must come up with significant introduction of um, research capability. The other thing again is that we need to also have researchers in Nigeria who research on what is important. I have many friends who are professors and researchers who research on what doesn't change the lifestyle of anybody. It's just a total waste of their time and their time. I mean, so, for example, is it to be easy that is world malaria? Mm. The, 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 the continent most affected by, Malay, by, by uh, malaria in the world is Africa. How many of our researchers research on uh, malaria? But they want to research on exotic issues. So part of what needs to change is that our people need to understand that research is supposed to be making people's lives better. When you do research on the potentials of having three-legged chicken, how does that help my life? <laughs> what is the difference that will make at the end of the day? Ask yourself this very simple question. And that's, and that's why I ask every time when I see a friend who says, I just did the paper, I say, so who for? Who is going to consume it? I mean, I spent, I spent, I, I've been a lecturer in Nigerian universities in the last, uh, I don't know, 20 something years. Um, my first few years in university doing research, I was focused on researching as an academic. I was writing books, I was doing research. I never had that mentality that there's somebody across the road that could use my research. Because somebody actually told me as a young researcher then that that should be my focus. And for all that period of time, I did not have any private sector person come to ask me for solutions. And then I had this very calm moment where I just said about that. So what's all of this about? So today I send you my research, but I get people to fund it and I get people to ask me for what I think about issues from the private sector. We must stop doing researches that do not make a difference. We must have the town responding to the down. And maybe the other point is that we must also create small, small solutions to big, big problems. I, I still don't understand how you go to a university to teach and you want to go to their toilet and the toilet will not finish. And I asked them, don't you have a department of civil engineering? I said, we have. And I said, okay, so why don't you give your final year to get that research to solve this problem? Uh, or, or you go to some universities and, uh, and why can't you invest over and feed the whole of them? Why can't you buy from feed the whole of them? Why can't ABU feed the whole of the world? Why can't Ibadan is a center for agricultural research in Nigeria? There are so many research centers in Ibadan, from Niles to Crane uh, to Fomeku to Frame to College and various colleges in Ibadan. But does a woman that sells beans in Bodija Market know the impact of that? No. Because people are doing research that doesn't make a difference in people's lives. So the question you ask yourself is, we need to um, be market-driven and be willing to solve problems for individuals based on ourselves. Okay, so you're saying more blame goes to the town itself, not the town taking advice from the town. The question is that uh, if I need advice, I'll go for where the advice is. If the advice is not in the town, I will not go there. Now, let me tell you what has also happened. And I'm not sure, I'm sure both sides could do more. The, what has now happened is that town has actually recruited people from the town to work for them. So instead of this professor who sits in the university and teaching, town has recruited him as a consultant somewhere where he's working for them. So town is now galvanizing itself. So now, so that's why they wouldn't go because the guy they're going to meet is their staff. So uh, it's a question of both sides. Now town also needs to improve because of the fact that if you don't fund them, um, you won't get the kind of results you want. So it's, it's a balance. Now, you could fund them because they can do research for you, 
But you could you should also fund them to develop the capacity to do research for you. So for example, something as simple as market survey, something as simple as that. Um, why can't a telecoms company go to the Department of Masscom to tell them of my status? Help us do survey of how people use our product here, or even your TV stations. So you want to know who watches your TV the most at what time of the day. Why don't you just walk to the university close by and say, well, give me the Department of Statistics and go there. It's going to be cheaper than you getting a consultant outside, but you'll be building capacity and you'll be building brand value. And that's part of the ideas we need to have uh, as we move on to integrate town and Nigeria. Okay, interesting. Thanks for staying with us on the program today. I hope you enjoyed everything we brought to you. But you know, like it's not a tradition, we do not go on to, we let you see one or two quotes that would actually spoil you to take the necessary actions today. And that is our quotes for the day. This is what we have for you today. And so we've come to the end of today's episode of From the Ivory Tower. Do well to join me next time for something fresh, interesting, and much more educative. My name remains Omotayo Alo. Bye for now.